Chapter 2 The President Emeritus of the Rick's Interest was not destined to uninterpreted cogitation. However, within ten minutes his private exchange operator called him to the telephone. What is it? Cappy yelled into the transmitter. There's a young man in the general office. His name is Mr. William E. Peck, and he desires to see you personally. Cappy sighed. Very well, he replied. Have him shown in. Almost immediately, the office boy ushered Mr. Peck into Cappy's presence. The moment he was fairly inside the door, the visitor halted, came easily and naturally to attention, and bowed respectfully, while the cool glance of his keen blue eyes held steadily the autocrat of the Blue Star Navigation Company. Mr. Ricks, Peck is my name, sir. William E. Peck. Thank you, sir, for acceding to my request for an interview. Ahem. Hmm. Cappy looked belligerent. Sit down, Mr. Peck. Mr. Peck sat down, but as he crossed to the chair beside Cappy's desk, the old gentleman noticed that his visitor walked with a slight limp, and that his left forearm had been amputated halfway to the elbow. To the observant Cappy, the American Legion button in Mr. Peck's lapel told the story. Well, Mr. Peck, he queried gently, what can I do for you? I've called for my job, the veteran replied briefly. By the holy pink-toed prophet, Cappy ejaculated. You say that like a man who doesn't expect to be refused. Quite right, sir. I do not anticipate a refusal. Why? Mr. William E. Peck's engaging but somewhat plain features rippled into the most compelling smile Cappy Ricks had ever seen. I am a salesman, Mr. Ricks, he replied. I know that statement to be true because I have demonstrated over a period of five years that I can sell my share of anything that has a hockable value. I have always found, however, that before proceeding to sell goods, I had to sell the manufacturer of those goods something, to wit, myself. I am about to sell myself to you. Son, said Cappy smilingly, you win. You've sold me already. When did they sell you a membership in the military forces of the United States of America? On the morning of April 7, 1917, sir. That clinches our sale. I soldiered with the Knights of Columbus at Camp Kimi myself. But when they refused to let me go abroad with my division, my heart was broken. So I went over the hill. That little touch of the language of the line appeared to warm Mr. Peck's heart considerably, establishing at once a free masonry between them. I was with the Portland Lumber Company selling lumber in the Middle West before the war, he explained. Uncle Sam gave me my sheepskin at Letterman General Hospital last week, with half disability on my $10,000 worth of government insurance. Whittling my wing was a mere trifle, but my broken leg was a long time mending, and now it's shorter than it really ought to be. And I've developed pneumonia with influenza, and they found some TB indications after that. I've been at the Government Tuberculosis Hospital at Fort Bayard, New Mexico for a year. However, what's left of me is certified to be sound. I've got five inches chest expansion, and I feel fine. Not at all blue or discouraged, Cappy Hazard. Oh, I got off easy, Mr. Ricks. I have my head left, and my right arm. I can think and I can write, and even if one of my wheels is flat, I can hike longer and faster after an order than most. Got a job for me, Mr. Ricks? No, I haven't, Mr. Peck. I'm out of it, you know? Retired ten years ago. This office is merely a headquarters for social frivolity, a place to get my mail, and mill over the gossip of the street. Our Mr. Skinner is the chap you should see. I have seen Mr. Skinner, sir, the erstwhile warrior replied, but he wasn't very sympathetic. I think he jumped to the conclusion that I was attempting to trade him my empty sleeve. He informed me that there wasn't sufficient business to keep his present staff of salesmen busy. So then I told him I'd take anything from stenographer up. I'm the champion one-handed typist of the United States Army. I can tally lumber and billet. I can keep books and answer the phone. No encouragement, eh? No, sir. Well, now, son, Cappy informed his cheerful visitor confidently, you take my tip and see my son-in-law, Captain Peasley. He's high, low, and jack in the game in the shipping end of our business. I have also interviewed Captain Peasley. He was very kind. He said he felt that he owed me a job, but business is so bad he couldn't make a place for me. He told me he's now carrying a dozen ex-servicemen merely because he hasn't the heart to let them go. I believe him. Well, my dear boy, my dear young friend, why do you come to me? Because, Mr. Peck replied smilingly, 
I want you to go over their heads and give me a job. I don't care a hoot what it is, provided I can do it. If I can do it, I'll do it better than it was ever done before. And if I can't do that, I'll quit to save you the embarrassment of firing me. I'm not an object of charity, but I'm scarcely the man I used to be, and I'm four years behind the procession, and I have to catch up. I have the best of references. I see you have, Cappy cut in blandly and pressed the push button on his desk. Mr. Skinner entered. He glanced disapprovingly at William E. Peck, and then turned inquiring eyes toward Cappy Ricks. Skinner, dear boy, Cappy purred amiably. I've been thinking over the proposition to send Andrews out to the Shanghai office, and I've come to this conclusion. We'll have to take a chance. At the present time, that office is in charge of a stenographer, and we've got to get a manager on the job without further loss of time. So I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll send Andrews out on the next boat, but inform him that his position is temporary. Then, if he doesn't make good out there, we can take him back into this office, where he is a most valuable man. Meanwhile, ahem, <clears throat> Harumph. Meanwhile, you'd oblige me greatly, Skinner, my dear boy, if you would consent to take this young man into your office and give him a good workout to see the stuff he's made of. As a favor to me, Skinner, my dear boy, as a favor to me. Mr. Skinner, in the language of the sporting world, was down for the counts and knew it. Young Mr. Peck knew it too and smiled graciously upon the general manager. For young Mr. Peck had been in the army where one of the first great lessons to be assimilated is this, that the commanding general's request is always tantamount to an order. Very well, sir, Mr. Skinner replied coldly. Have you arranged the compensation to be given, Mr. Peck? Cappy threw up a deprecating hand. That detail is entirely up to you, Skinner. Far be it from me to interfere in the internal administration of your department. Naturally, you will pay Mr. Beck what he is worth and not a cent more. He turned to the triumphant Peck. Now, you listen to me, young feller. If you think you're slipping gracefully into a good thing, disabuse your mind of that impression right now. You'll step right up to the plate, my son, and you'll hit the ball fairly on the nose, and you'll do it early and often. The first time you tip a foul, you'll be warned. The second time you do it, you'll get a month's layoff to think it over. And the third time, you'll be out for keeps. Do I make myself clear? You do, sir, Mr. Peck declared happily. All I ask is fighting room, and I'll hack my way into Mr. Skinner's heart. Thank you, Mr. Skinner, for consenting to take me on. I appreciate your action very, very much, and shall endeavor to be worthy of your confidence. Young scoundrel, infernal young scoundrel, Cappy murmured to himself. He has a sense of humor, thank God. Ah, poor old narrow-gauge Skinner. If that fellow ever gets a new or unconventional thought in his stodgy head, it'll kill him overnight. He's hopping mad right now because he can't say a word in his own defense. But if he doesn't make, he'll look like a summer holiday for Mr. Bill Beck. I'm due to be mercifully chloroformed. Good Lord, how empty life would be if I couldn't butt in and raise a little riot every once in so often. Young Mr. Peck had risen and was standing at attention. When do I report for duty, sir? He queried of Mr. Skinner. Whenever you're ready, Skinner retorted with a wintry smile. Mr. Peck glanced at a cheap wristwatch. It's 12 o'clock now, he soliloquized aloud. I'll pop out, wrap myself around some rations, and report on the job at 1 p.m. I might just as well knock out half a day's pay. He glanced at Cappy Ricks and quoted, Count that day lost whose low-descending son finds prices shot to glory and business done for fun. Unable to maintain his composure in the face of such levity during office hours, Mr. Skinner withdrew, still wrapped in his sub-Antarctic dignity. As the door closed behind him, Mr. Peck's eyebrows went up in a manner indicative of apprehension. I'm off to a bad start, Mr. Ricks, he opined. You only asked for a start, Cappy piped back at him. I didn't guarantee you a good start. I wouldn't because I can't. I can only drive Skinner and Matt Peasley so far, and no farther. There's always a point at which I quit, William. More familiarly known as Bill Peck, sir. Very well, Bill. Cappy slid out to the edge of his chair and peered at Bill Beck baefully over the top of his spectacles. I'll have my eye on you, young feller, he shrilled. I freely acknowledge our indebtedness to you, but the day you get the notion in your head that this office is an old soldier's home, he paused thoughtfully. I wonder what Skinner will pay you, he mused. 
Oh well, he continued. Whatever it is, take it and say nothing. And when the moment is propitious and provided you've earned it, I'll intercede with the danged old relic and get you a race. Thank you very much, sir. You are most kind. Good day, sir. And Bill Peck picked up his hat and limped out of the presence. Scarcely had the door closed behind him than Mr. Skinner re-entered Cappy Rick's lair. He opened his mouth to speak, but Cappy silenced him with an imperious finger. Not a peep out of you, Skinner, my dear boy, he chirped amiably. I know exactly what you're going to say, and I admit you're right to say it. But as now, Skinner, listen to reason. How the devil could you have the heart to reject that crippled ex-soldier? There he stood on one sound leg with his sleeve tucked into his coat pocket and on his homely face the grin of an unwhipped, unbeatable man. But you, blast your cold, unfeeling soul, Skinner, looked him in the eye and turned him down like a drunkard turns down near beer. Skinner, how could you do it? Undaunted by Cappy's admonitory finger, Mr. Skinner struck a distinctively defiant attitude. There's no sentiment in business, he replied angrily. A week ago, last Thursday, the local post of the American Legion commenced their organized drive for jobs for their crippled and unemployed comrades. And within three days, you've sawed off 209 such jobs on the various corporations that you control. The gang you shipped up to the mill in Washington has already applied for a charter for a new post to be known as Cappy Rick's Post Number 534. And you had experienced men discharged to make room for these ex-soldiers. You bet I did, Cappy yelled triumphantly. It's always old home week in every logging camp and sawmill in the Northwest for IWWs and revolutionary communists. I'm sick of their unauthorized strikes and sabotage. And by the holy pink-toed prophet, Cappy Rick's post number 534, American Legion is the only sort of backfire I can think of to put the Wobblies on the run. Every office and ship and retail yard could be run by a first sergeant, Skinner complained. I'm thinking of having reveille and retreat and bugle calls and Saturday morning inspections. I tell you, sir, the Rick's interests have absorbed all the old soldiers possible, and at the present moment those interests are overflowing with glory. What we want are workers, not talkers. These ex-soldiers spend too much time fighting their battles over again. Well, Comrade Peck is the last one I'll ask you to absorb, Skinner, Cappy promised contritely. Ever read Kipling's Barrack Room Ballad, Skinner? I have no time to read, Mr. Skinner protested. Go uptown this minute and buy a copy and read one ballad entitled Tommy, Cappy barked. For the good of your immortal soul, he added. Well, Comrade Peck doesn't make a hit with me, Mr. Ricks. He applied to me for a job and I gave him his answer. Then he went to Captain Matt and was refused. So just to demonstrate his bad taste, he went over our heads and induced you to pitchfork him into a job. He'll curse the day he was inspired to do that. Skinner, Skinner, look me in the eye. Do you know why I asked you to take on Bill Peck? I do, because you're too tender-hearted for your own good. You unimaginative dunderhead. You gibbering jackdaw. How could I reject a boy who simply would not be rejected? Why, I'll bet a ripe peach that Bill Beck was one of the doggonest finest soldiers you ever saw. He carries his objective. He sized you up just like that, Skinner. He declined to permit you to block him. Skinner, that peck person has been opposed by experts. Yes, sir, experts. What kind of a job are you going to give him, Skinner, my dear boy? Andrew's job, of course. Oh, yes, I forgot, Skinner, dear boy. Haven't we got about half a million feet of skunk spruce to saw off on somebody? Mr. Skinner nodded, and Cappy continued with all the naive eagerness of one who has just made a marvelous discovery, which he is confident will revolutionize science. Give him that stinking stuff to peddle, Skinner, and if you can dig up a couple of dozen carloads of red fur or bull pine in transit, or some short or odd length stock, or some larch ceiling or flooring, or some hemlock random stock, in fact, anything the trade doesn't want as a gift, you get me, don't you, Skinner? Mr. Skinner smiled his swordfish smile. And if he fails to make good, au revoir, eh? Yes, I suppose so, although I hate to think about it. On the other hand, if he makes good, he's to have Andrew's salary. We must be fair, Skinner. Whatever our faults, we must always be fair. He rose and patted the general manager's lean shoulder. There, there, Skinner, my boy. Forgive me if I have been a trifle. 
Skinner, if you put a prohibitive price on that skunk fur by the holy pink-toed prophet, I'll fire you. Be fair, boy. Be fair. No dirty work, Skinner. Remember, Comrade Peck has half of his left forearm buried in France.